So that was my doing, sorry. The ladies had done a beautiful job putting every single flower we received on the shroud. But the idea behind the shroud is that we have to wrap the shroud up with the corpus that will be taken down from the crucifix, and it goes in the tomb at the end. And so we just had to have a smaller number so that we can put the whole thing. And if those flowers will always be sacrificed because they will die with the statue over the next two, two to three days. So normally we have a large procession that is done that when the second gospel, you have two gospels that are read, when the first gospel is read, one of the candles representing the good thief will be lit. The other one never gets lit from the perdition. And that body is then taken down off of the cross and is laid. And normally we will have a procession and people will follow. In fact, normally, if we didn't live in the Arctic North, we would go outside. And when we come back into the church, normally the men who are holding the shroud hold it in the back of the church. And everyone who's in the procession coming in, duck down underneath the shroud coming in, indicating their entrance into the tomb with our Lord. Unfortunately, since it's the apocalypse, we can't have the full procession, but I wanted to explain to you exactly what we're doing normally. So the procession will just be small like we did on Palm Sunday with just the servers and the priests. When we come to the adoration, which is on your page, on page seven, well, for me is Mark 73 on the bottom. You see, we have the metany and the adoration of Christ. Metany, when we come back in to the end of the procession up back to the frontier and the body will be laid on the catafalque, normally what is done is everyone comes up, does their adoration of our Lord in his death, and kiss the feet of the image of our Lord, which obviously we're not going to do. And so what will happen is we will do, as usual, the prayer that is here, the Teshbuchto Morio. We'll do that little verse from that prayer. Then you notice on 73, we have the Meshicho Destilab Tech Lochfein. So Meshicho is Christ, Destlept, crucified, Chlofein for us. That the, the servers and, and, the, and I will do what is called metani, which is to go down on all fours with your forehead to the ground. I'm afraid at this point my life forehead to the ground is perhaps a little optimistic, but we will do as far as we can do. And what you will do, because you're not coming up to do the adoration of the image of our Lord, is you bow profoundly from the waist, Again, as optimistically as you can bow from the waist. And that way, all, all of us will be doing the same adoration of our Lord as we sing that three times. Then I will take the shroud with the body and go over, and it will be placed in the tomb, and the tomb will be closed. All right? So it's a basic, just to give you a basic explanation of the things that will be modified for this year. So we will start, and what we will do is not Psalm 22, is you'll be able to sit and we will recite the hymn on the cross of our Lord and God on pages 57 and 58. So we'll recite the longer hymn, but you can sit for that once we've started up. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Grant us, O Lord, the resplendent colors of your compassion and mercy, to paint in our hearts the image of you hanging upon the cross, out of love between two thieves. When we will have imprinted the awesome vision of your passion in our spirits, then we will be worthy of the glory of your resurrection and the gift of your grace. And we shall worship and praise you for your mercy toward us. 
with your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. On the cross, our Lord and God, in the center of the world, he revealed that we were saved. Jesus cried, My God, my God, why? shame and suffering, cross of glory and of love, on your wood Eve's curse was nailed, and from you all blessings come. Though you stripped our Savior, yet you clothe us now with the robe of light. We adore your cross, O Lord. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the heavenly peacemaker who was hung on the wood of the cross. He opened his arms and gathered all people and nations. The Lord became flesh, and by his cross he has saved the world. He received true glory and worship from all corners of the earth. The good shepherd showed his goodness to his flock by caring for his sheep. He proved how much he loved them by offering himself. To the good one be glory and honor all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. We worship.
worship, thank, and praise your divinity, O God, for you created us in your image and formed us in your likeness. We praise your salvation, O lover of all people. On this Friday you gave us life by your cross and set us free by your whole death. In the beginning you completed our creation on a Friday, the sixth day. Your holy hands for mortal Adam from the dust of the earth and you molded and created him in your image. From your mouth you breathe the breath of life into him. Thus he was fashioned in beauty and perfected in knowledge, a marvelous creation. But in his ignorance, Adam wandered, neglected your command, and was delivered up to judgment. Death now entered to distort the image of your creation. But even after this, O oh compassionate and loving Lord, your mercy has prevailed. On the sixth day, another Friday filled with mysteries, your hands were nailed to the cross. You were humiliated and mocked, and your sign was pierced in order to give new life to the work of your hands through the blood and water which flowed from your side. On this Friday of your saving passion and the commemoration of your life-giving cross, the Church petitions you through the mouths of her children with the fragrance of this incense. As in the beginning you created out of love and then returned to save and give new life, now grant your mercy upon us, the work of your creation. By your cross, grant peace to the entire universe. By your cross, remove anger and put an end to wars. By your cross, eliminate all dissension. By your cross, curb violence and pacify the angry. By your cross, humble the proud, expose the self-serving, and remove the enemy. By your cross, establish your church in strength, and make her monasteries and convents firm. By your cross, purify your priests and exalt the deacons. By your cross, sustain the elderly, subdue the haste of youth, and educate the young. By your cross, pardon sinners, Forgive the wrongdoers and guard your flock which now worships you, honors your passion, embraces your wounds and is glorified and exalted by your crucifixion. Save us and save all your people. Completely perfect us in your strength. 
Visit us and revive us so that your image may be renewed and our likeness be recovered. May your comfort take away the sadness of our hearts and your compassion dry our tears. Then we shall wear your glory and be clothed in your light. Make us worthy to meet the day of your resurrection as heirs in the kingdom. Then without ceasing we shall raise glory to you now and forever. Come, O faithful church. of forgiveness you offered yourself on the wood of the cross for foolish sinners you sacrificed yourself for our sake now O Lord cancel the debt of our guilt and save us from retribution Remove the scourge of anger and all suffering from us. Encourage us with your joyful hope and your healing remedy. In your compassion, pardon the faithful departed, and we shall praise you with them. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Praise the mighty one who carries earth and heaven, for he willed to carry his cross and endure pain. On this day, the Son of Justice, A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. 
And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked in a burial place with the evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life. And the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, My servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, For if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited and crucified. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing, well, then, does God supply you with the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing works of the law or by your believing what you heard? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel before and to Abraham, saying, All Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who are believed Those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. For all who rely on the words of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed who is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Jesus Christ 
the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Praise be to God always. And oh, Exalt the Lord before our God. Bow down before his When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing and the men stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, Truly I tell you, this day you shall be with me in paradise. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, and they placed a sponge full of that wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Cursed be the one who hangs upon the cross. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this long reading to the Galatians is precisely the turmoil that was taking place in that parish was the intrigue of all the details of the law of Moses. 
It's why St. Paul, writing to the Galatians, says, well, why have you become bewitched? Why are you bedazzled by this stuff? Phylacteries, dietary laws, and all of these other aspects. And he says, how did you actually come to believe in Christ in the first place? Was it because you discovered the law, or was it from hearing when the good tidings, the gospel was announced to you? And that's why he says you become bewitched. You're looking to find your healing, your salvation, in stuff. Because it's cool. It's neat. Who doesn't want a menorah and do Hanukkah and lighting candles? He says, with all of this, this is all gone. Christ became the law for us. And in his death on Calvary, abolished the law. Which is why in the Gospels, when they speak to make us clear that the place between the Holy of Holies and the holy place within the temple, that veil was torn. And we're told in the Gospels from the top to the bottom, this was not done by human hands. And the Holy of Holies represents that presence of God among his people. One of the things that we will continually come back and try to reflect on on these days is the notion of presence. Presence is not just a thing, like the pew that's under your bum. Presence is a choice. That's why, as we've talked over these weeks, the ability to hear, the ability to converse, that's a choice to make. It's not just by being in the room that we're necessarily involved in a conversation with uh uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh along the way, thinking that we duped them. Presence is a choice to actually be present. It's not just a question of existence. God, of course, metaphysically, philosophically, God is present to everything. Every single subatomic particle force, whatever, in the cosmos, every quark, every force, God is present to whole and entire in every aspect and whole and entire in the whole. Whole and entire to every single minuscule, unseen, unmeasurable part and whole and entire to the whole. So what is the incarnation? If God is already present. This is an important point because the whole world is filled with people now who say, well, I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. And of course, they will come back philosophically and say, well, God is everywhere, which of course is true. So what is the crucifixion? What is the incarnation? It is presence. It is God's desire to be personally among us, to communicate to us, to speak to us. And then even more importantly, in rending that human nature upon Calvary to allow access to the Holy of Holies, which is the divinity to us who believe. That is the condemnation of the law, which was only for one people, Israel. But God's plan was not only for one people, it was for all of humanity. And presence is this entrance into this world by incarnation, so that in embracing the entire reality of human nature, God himself then can transform that human nature in that presence and allow us, his creatures, access to that presence. That is the opening of the side and the revelation of the Sacred Heart on Good Friday. That is the blood and water that come forth from our Lord, which for the Father is is the Eucharist and baptism. That work, which is merely to embrace an unjust death, is presence. St. Rafka laying on her sickbed for decades, years, is presence. And that embrace of a reality of God's work within our lives is presence. But we can only embrace that presence when we see presence. 
And that's again throughout these weeks of the Great Lent, we've talked about that everything is meant to become transparent. Every action, everything that we consider to be good, and everything that we consider to be bad should be transparent so that we see God present. There is nothing worse than Good Friday, and yet, ironically, we call it good. The betrayal, deicide, the killing of God, the betrayal of Judas, these things are what, in their badness, become the very source of life because of presence. When we are called to faith and illuminated in our spirits, this has meant that we are to replicate and to be presence of the divinity ourselves in our own generation. When we understand this, we understand why St. Paul is so hard on the parishioners in Galicia. Because by their ignorance and their embrace of stuff, they show that they do not understand presence. And because they do not understand presence, there is no vision of transparency. They are blind. And they trip over themselves and fail in being healed. And that failure in being healed is precisely the word salvation. So what we look on Good Friday, and it's said in the gospel that they look upon the one whom they pierced. We're also told in the gospel as they're casting lots for his clothing, who is going to get the stuff after you strip him naked? No reason getting rid of good clothes. We're told that they cast lots, and then they just sit there and look at him, just watch him die. That is existence there, but that is not presence. They believe in nothing that is taking place. For them, it's my chance to get a new coat. Between the two thieves, there is one who is blind and recognizes nothing. Though they are both Paul, but just about the same distance from our Lord on either side, one sees nothing and the other is present. On the day of judgment, our Lord says there will be two in a field. One will be taken, one left behind. That may be physically the way it's going to happen, but what is clearly being taught is a question of presence. He's saying that one person in that field is already present to the kingdom, but the other one working next to them, clueless. Between these two thieves, one recognizes something very profoundly differently from another, seeing the same reality of a man who has been beaten black and blue and covered in blood, dying like them, in the same manner, being crucified in front of public ridicule. But one sees something different because of presence. When you as a Catholic walk into a church, you react differently because of presence that you see. Others who do not see presence bumble along, watching them try to make a genuflection for the first time in their life is usually slightly humorous. But it is a question of presence. And so on this Good Friday, when we look at this reality, our repentance is to understand that our Lord by the touch of grace of his sacred heart, is asking for us to be transformed in our own participation in his presence, within his sacred heart, that we ourselves become that vehicle, not of yammering and philosophical arguments about the truth of this religion, but of being the religion by presence that cannot be denied. No one can avoid conversion when they are touched by goodness that they see in the life of another. Why do some of these great saints become the great apostles and the great sources of conversion? Because the people around them cannot but see presence. 
And so the Galatians who have found healing by hearing, who now turn towards stuff, are going diametrically opposed to what the gospel is. And therefore, they are jeopardizing their entire possibility of salvation. So that that aspect of presence is why St. Paul can say, for me, to live is Christ. It's not a pious cliche. He has come to understand that my existence has been transformed by the very reality of God become man. God made a choice so that my life itself can become that incarnate reality of God, which is Christ. Could we possibly ask for any greater gift? Nothing matters other than that. Not our retirement fund, not our car, not our house, our vacations, our summer home, our camp. Those things can all be taken away. But no one can take from me presence. And even being stripped naked and stripped in poverty and thrown in prison, I still have presence. I still have this possibility of the grace of God. So that's an example of an extreme. But what our Lord is asking of us for our conversion during the Great Lent is not to be in pain, not to give up things, not to cause ourselves pain because we like chocolate so we won't eat chocolate. Those things are so minuscule. And yet, over the last seven weeks, we have realized how weak we truly are. Because even to give up those little things, it has been in agony so often. And so often, not in agony at all, because we just went boof and we went off after these things. Because we did not see presence. If we saw Christ present to us at each moment, if we knew that our lives were Christ, as St. Paul says in this epistle, Things don't become a walk in the park, but they become doable, and in entering deeper into the light, they become very joyous, even when we're crucified. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They do not see. They do not touch presence. They are wounded profoundly in their being. So let us ask the Lord our God today, that his sacred heart, which was opened on this day, manifest its light, its beauty, its charity as presence to us, that our ears may be opened to that presence, to be transformed into the children of light, and to become truly the disciples of the sacred heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. There is a basket coming around because we're supposed to be doing our collection for the Holy Land today. So we will pause for a moment so that we can aid our brothers and sisters who live in the Holy Lands. Part of this collection will also go to our Maronite brethren who are in the eparchy of Haifa, which is one of our poorer eparchies in the world, just to keep in mind. Sam, please. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of God, O crucified one, lifted high on the cross, 
You raised up creation to its wondrous creator on high. We call out to you in prayer, O Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of God, you were stripped and nailed to the wood of shame, that we may be clothed with glory and victory. We call out to you in prayer, O Lord. Hear us. The church song. Thank you. 